Hello everyone, I'm Thomas and this is Rittens, where we write whole worlds. Here's a story about an artifact forgotten in time, a key that will set in motion a chain of events that will shape the history of Amirna forever. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the fantasy tale of antiquity. Let's see, what do we have here? The old heen said as he pulled the wrapped cloth loose. The ancient linen fell apart like dust in his gloved hand. Petrified in time, it stood testament to its age. Having lost its structure, the majority of the fabric began to fall apart, revealing the object within. Like a light rainfall, the dust fell through the barbs of a silver feather, easily the size of the heen's forearm, or about 23 centimeters. A feather? The elder heen mumbled incredulously. Why would they hide that away? Using the smallest brush he could find, he began dusting the feather off. Starting from the outer edge, he worked his way inward, until he finally got to the bottom of the quill. After putting the brush away, he gently picked the object up and inspected it closely. His assistant had been quietly watching the professor from his chair behind him, when a soft glow radiated from the feather, just outside his field of vision. Hold up. The professor's eyes widened slightly as he turned the feather around. This is actually made out of silver. His assistant looked up from behind him and got out of his chair as he responded. But this temple had been sealed for thousands of years. There is no way they had the technology to smelt such complicated alloys. But this temple had been sealed for thousands of years. There is no way they had the technology to smelt such complicated alloys. The professor turned around to face him, holding the feather up. What if I told you it was pure silver? He grabbed a couple barbs between his fingers and with a flick of his hand bent them all downward. The assistant's eyes widened in shock as he shouted out, What are you doing? The professor simply smiled at him. After a few seconds, the feather glowed a soft blue light. The assistant immediately grew silent as he watched the folded barbs straighten out by themselves. Ah, was the only word that managed to escape his mouth as he stared at the feather, which had dulled again. It's probably some form of natural arcana, the professor said, placing the feather back on the platform. We'll have to ask Arcanium Garantis to analyze it. Or, he gave his assistant a mischievous look, we could try to figure it out ourselves and become famous. Uh, but Professor, his assistant sputtered, we have strict orders to hand over any Arcana-related artifacts. The professor smiled again and said, Oh, but if this isn't Arcana, then it would be our job to discover what it is, correct? The assistant looked conflicted, so the professor quickly added, if we do make a discovery, you'd have your doctorate in the bag. The assistant thought to himself for a second, but caved after a while. <sighs> All right, I'll do it. With those words, the two set to work. Minutes turned to hours and days turned to weeks before... No, 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 wait. If that's the case... The elder Hing professor cleared his desk in one fell swoop. Countless documents, binders, books, and tools came clattering down as he placed his schematics on the table. A few months had passed since they first began their investigation of the Silver Feather. After many dead avenues had been thoroughly explored, experimentation had revealed that it restored its shape when the barbs are bent in almost all cases, except for one. If one sequentially bent the barbs inward, in a specific order, the barbs would remain in place. If an error was made, the entire feather reverted back to its original shape, and the process had to be restarted. This process was lengthy, involved, and tedious, for even a tiny amount of pressure deviation would result in hours of work being lost. Today, however, was different. Looking back at his notes once more, the professor grabbed the relevant schematic and turned his chair around as he looked between the feather in his assistant's hands and his papers. 
he rapidly sketched down their latest discovery. Only two barbs remained, meaning that the last decision was... The 50-50, huh? His assistant said as he carefully held the quill of the feather. Indeed, the professor exclaimed happily. I knew the last part would be quick. <laughs> All right, I'll leave it to you, Septimus. His apprentice bit the corner of his lower lip for a fraction of a second as he pondered his decision. He brushed his unkempt black hair out of his eyes and scratched the stubble which had formed on his chin over the past few months. All right, well, here goes, he said as he took the upper barb and folded it upward to align with the ones adjacent to it. Both of them held their breaths as they waited for the feather to glow. I think... Septimus started, but was interrupted by the professor. That's it! Good job! He exclaimed ecstatically. That leaves just that one. The shape is pretty obvious, but let's see if it fits. Taking a deep breath, Septimus focused himself on the feather in his hands once more. Okay, let's finish this. With a quick motion, he grabbed the final barb and aligned it with the others. Both of them stared intently at the feather, which began to glow after a few seconds. No! the professor exclaimed. But something was different. The light emitted by the feather grew so bright it was almost blinding. Forced to avert their gazes, they waited for the light to pass. When adult once more, both of them let out a soft gasp. So it was a key after all, Septimus said under his breath. The barbs of the feather had allowed themselves to be bent in the shape of a jacket key. When he put the final barb in place, it seemed to have undergone a transformation. All of the barbs had melted together, forming a solid silver key. The professor caught up and excitedly took the key out of his hands. Handling it like porcelain, he placed it upon his desk as he began sketching the shape. This is fascinating. This is amazing. This is a huge discovery, he shouted to nobody in particular. Septimus shifted to the back of the room. Indeed, Professor, you've done great, he said as he walked up behind him. But your work is done now. What do you mean, Septimus, my boy? It has only just begun. We have to go. He was interrupted by a sharp pain in his back. A pool of blood formed in his mouth as his eyes widened in shock. A large military dagger had pierced his lungs from behind. The hand holding the hilt twisted it once, causing the elder heen to scream out in pain. No, Professor, I'm pretty sure you're done, Septimus said as he pulled the dagger out. The confusion on the old man's face quickly turned into comprehension as the strength escaped his body. Clutching his chest as he stared his apprentice in the eyes, he used all of his remaining energy to try to speak, but no words left his lips. His life expired as Septimus smiled at him. Good night, Professor, he said sarcastically as he pushed the old man's body out of the way. A bit rude of you to get our key all dirty, he said as he used his mentor's rope to clean the artifact up. But I guess you've helped us out, so thanks. A glint of madness shone in his eyes. He carefully wrapped the key up and put it in his backpack. Gavma. In response to his arcane request, the schematics they had spent months making caught on fire. The flames quickly spread to the canvas of their tent, soon covered the majority of the interior. Quickly exited the tent without looking back at the body of his mentor. He pulled his hood up. The professor's body was found a few days later, during a routine checkup. The nature of the fire made it impossible to investigate what had happened, and none cared enough to question it. Soon, he would be remembered only by his statistic. Professor G. R. Ernstbern. Cause of death? Occupational fatality. Well, get to it! The thin and tall man shouted at Septimus as he pushed the latter forward. A small group of people followed behind the two within his... 
A small group of people followed behind the two within this sanctum of a temple long forgotten. The darkness of this place was held at bay by virtue of two dim candles, which barely illuminated the ground upon which they stood. The apparent leader wore loose clothes that concealed the majority of his form, but his exposed hands and face held intricate tribal tattoos. The sclera of his eyes had been dyed red. Septimus clutched the silvery key tightly, the fruit of his many months of labor, as he approached the end of the interior. At the base of the back wall stood an inelegant stone table, rudely carved out of a larger rock still attached to the floor. This structure formed the foundation of a pedestal upon which nothing lay. The sconces on the pillars that supported the room were petrified through time, and none of their fuel remained. Anything organic that had existed here had perished instantly when the seal placed upon this temple was removed, creating odd piles of inconsistent dust throughout the temple. Taking a few steps forward, he placed his hands upon the table, and in one motion jumped onto it. Now, where are you? He mumbled to himself as his hands gently slid over the wall, carefully inspecting every square centimeter his hands could reach, he quickly discovered no opening existed. Cold sweat built up on his forehead as he panicked slightly. Not daring to turn around to tell the leader, he restarted his investigation. What are you waiting for? The leader's cold voice rang loudly through the empty sanctum, freezing Septimus in place. He tried to speak up, but no words escaped him. Do it, the leader continued. Yes, sir, Septimus stammered as he panically continued his search. Another minute passed before the leader lost his patience. Useless filth! With a sudden burst of light, Septimus was flung aside. An invisible force had struck him hard enough to crash him into the eastern wall, a solid five meters away from where he stood. With a sickening crack, he crumpled to the ground, unmoving, as blood began to pool underneath him, leaving only the key behind on the pedestal. The leader walked up to the key and gently picked it up. As he held it up above the pedestal, the markings on his arms and face began to glow alongside the key. Finally, he muttered as light filled their vision. The acolytes who had been following behind them began to whisper amongst each other, seemingly distraught by the turn of events. As the light grew brighter, the five of them took a step back, watching their leader get swallowed in the light. An omnidirectional, high-pitched shriek filled the empty temple halls, distorted in length. The voice modulated itself between high and low pitches, Nauseating snapping sounds originated from within the light, which visibly disturbed the acolytes. What do we do? One of them shouted as another grabbed his shoulders. Is this the master's will? Trust him. The shrieking ended without warning as the light died. The difference in brightness rendered them night blind until their eyes adjusted. They gazed expectantly at their leader, who stood over the pedestal, his hand still aloft as if he were holding something. But the key had disappeared. After a short while, a voice escaped his lips. How could this be? He aggressively turned around and grabbed the nearest acolyte, shaking him violently. Why am I still here? I don't know, sir. Perhaps the scriptures were wrong. An unnatural rage filled the leader's eyes. A flash of light emerged from the two as an invisible force twisted the acolyte's neck, snapping it. He fell to the ground as the leader rushed back up to the pedestal. Am I not worthy? Answer me, Xarizna! He shouted angrily as he slammed his hands on the pedestal. Tears flooded down his face. As despair beset him, a voice emerged from the eastern corner of the room. Indeed, 
You have no worth, Septimus said in a raspy voice from his crumpled heap in the corner. The leader's eyes widened in madness as he calmly walked over to him. What did you say? He asked calmly. I don't think I heard you correctly. A hint of rage mixed with his words as he spoke. Who do you think you are? Septimus' body was concealed by his long travel cloak. The hood had fallen over his face from the impact, but to everyone's surprise, he stood back up in the pool of his own blood, a smile just barely visible on his face from underneath the cloak. The better question is, who do you want to be? Septimus corrected the leader, whose face contorted in anger. Another flash of light occurred, but this time neither of them moved. The four remaining acolytes held their breath in fear of this exchange as the leader shouted out, What witchcraft is this? Seemingly baffled by the ineffectiveness of his arcana, he looked at his own hands as Septimus took a step closer to him. Placing his hands on the hem of his hood, Septimus pulled it back. His middle-length black hair was scruffy, and the light beard on his face looked unkempt. But what truly shocked the leader was, What's with those eyes? He uttered, fear and anger mixing as he stared at Septimus' face, for his eyes now carried not one, but two pupils each. What did you do? Septimus smiled at him once again as he responded, That which you could not. He grabbed the leader by the throat and lifted him up in the air. What are you doing? He sputtered as he grabbed and clawed at Septimus' hand. Cleaning up, Septimus said calmly. With one twist of his wrist, the leader's head bobbed forward with a snap, his body hanging limp in his hand. Seemingly disinterested in his remains, Septimus let him fall to the ground and walked over to the acolytes. Let's go, he said gesturing for them to follow him. They looked between each other, but none dared to speak against him. They followed obediently as he exited the temple. Xarizna has returned. And that's it. Sometimes a planned course of events can take a weird turn. Sometimes you get what you want, and sometimes your victims turn into ancient powerful arcanists. Like the video if you like liking likes, and subscribe for more subscriptions, yes. If you enjoyed this, I got just under a billion more of these on Instagram as well. Thank you very much for watching, and I wish you a fantastic day. Take care, and see you next time. Bye bye.